Okay, I guess I will start. Uh, good evening, everyone. I guess it's a bit late at six, but thank you for, uh, for joining the seminar today. The seminar today is about how will um, quantum computing and machine learning impact our cryptography and cybersecurity. Uh, before I start, let me allow me to introduce myself. My name is uh, Najwa Arash. Um, I am currently a chief researcher at the Cryptography Research Center um, at the Technology Innovation Institute. I'm acting chief researcher of the Autonomous Robotics Research Center. Um, I sit on the advisory board of few machine learning startups uh, and also of a venture capital in the US. And also I have the honor to be an adjunct professor at Mohammed bin Zayed University for Artificial Intelligence. Um, before that, I was a senior vice president at a cybersecurity startup called Dark Matter based out of the UAE. Um, before that, I worked in Booz Allen Hamilton and Booz and Company. Um, I also assumed a research uh, position within the Embedded System Security Group at IBM TJ Watson and also worked with Inter Research in Portland in Oregon. Um, I, the main focus of what I do today in terms of research is applied cryptography, cybersecurity for embedded uh, systems, and this is what I did in my PhD as well, which I obtained from Princeton University. And I'm extending my area of research um, by studying how machine learning impacts uh, cryptography, cryptanalysis, and also uh, the whole concept of cyber uh, reasoning. Uh, Um, in terms of in terms of research interest that I, I was just mentioning, so my, my interest is focused on applied crypto and security. I also work on cloud encryption schemes and confidential computing. Uh, I'm looking with my team today at uh, uh, research topics related to the cryptography and the cybersecurity when it comes to autonomous systems, especially control and navigation. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking at multiple areas of how we can apply machine learning for cybersecurity and cryptography, in particular for developing security solutions for embedded systems, the design and implementation of post-quantum crypto, um, the, the design of hybrid key establishment and hybrid digital signature algorithms, so hybrid between post-quantum and classical, and then finally focus on lightweight cryptography. So today, uh, the, the, the topic of this um, seminar uh, is, is split in half. In the first uh, half, I will speak about post-quantum cryptography. Uh, this is maybe this is a topic that is not directly related to machine learning, but I thought it would be good to introduce this topic because eventually when it comes to designing hardware accelerators for post-quantum crypto machine learning enablement could be an area of research to look into. And in fact, this is one of the topics I'm currently discussing with a, with a professor that works on hardware crypto in Radboud University. And then the second part of the seminar will be focused on machine learning and how machine learning can impact our cryptographic toolkit and cybersecurity systems in general. I'll try to limit my talk to 45 minutes and I will leave time for questions at the end. So please feel free to include your questions in the Q&A box. So first, as I said, let's talk about uh, post-quantum uh, cryptography. So for, for those of you who are not very familiar with the concept of cryptography, so cryptography is about hiding information. So if a sender wants to send information to the recipient, it's about using a secret key that is either established between the two or pre-shared between the two in order to protect uh, information. Today, we have two main topics uh, or two main actually classes or two main categories of cryptography. We have what we call the symmetric cryptography and we have what we call the public key cryptography or the asymmetric cryptography. The public key cryptography is in the context of the two users. Each one of them have a public private key pair. Um, and then for them to be able to encrypt information, one of them the he uh, one of them basically knows the public key of the other recipient he encrypts the information with the public key he sends it he sends it to this recipient and the recipient who is the only owner of the private key can decrypt it 
And in the context, when we talk about symmetric cryptography, both of them have a key that we refer to as the symmetric key. They encrypt the information with this same symmetric key, and then they decrypt the information also with the same symmetric key. So this is, in short, the concept of cryptography, which is used in order to um, protect the confidentiality of the information. In the same context of cryptography, we also have hash functions or functions and mathematical functions that are used in order to protect the integrity of information. Um, and, and from one side we have crypto and from other side, all of us are hearing about quantum computing. So you see lots of people that are talking about uh, quantum uh, supremacy. You hear about superconducting quantum technology. You hear about ion-based quantum technology, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 the advent of quantum computing is, is coming. It's not coming tomorrow. However, it is expecting within the next decades. How does quantum computing impact cybersecurity and cryptography? It is expected to impact it a big deal. So today, everything that we have in terms of public key infrastructure, which are based on two main mathematical hard, mathematically hard problems, uh, the integer factorization in the case of RSA and discrete logarithm in the, in, in the case of ECC, there is a quantum algorithm that we most of us know of. It's called the polynomial quantum algorithm, Shor algorithm, which will be able to factor integers and to compute discrete logarithms efficiently. So what this means is that most of today's infrastructure that is based on public key, um, uh, the SSL certificate, TLS connections, uh, certificate authorities, PKIs, etc. All of these will have a broken security once we have a quantum computer. Um, so the, the question that I get asked more often is that, wh why do you care about you know, the fact that, um, why, why do you care about the fact that there is the short algorithm? Does a small quantum computer or those 63, 65 qubits that we get, that we hear about today by Google and the likes, would they be able to run sure and would they be able to break cryptography? The fact is not really. The, the, today with the scale of the small scale of this quantum computer or this quantum processing machine that we have, we will not be able to run sure. In fact, in order for us to be able to run sure and break RSA, we need a quantum computer with 20 million qubit. And we all know that we are a bit far from this. And in order to be able to break ECC, we need about 10 million qubits, and also we are far from this. So why do we care? As cryptographers and as the cryptography community, why do we care? So today, if we look at how we store information and how we store encrypted information through governmental agencies or through a bank or any critical infrastructure, information is stored the, 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 let's say the statistics say that information is stored between 30 and 50 years. In those 30 and 50 years, the quantum computer is expected to become a reality. And then we would be able to launch what we refer to as the passive attacks. And this is why we care about, try, about migrating as of yesterday from the current public key infrastructure to post-quantum alternatives. So what is post-quantum cryptography? So what PQC means, and I will not get into complexity theory today uh, or bounded error polynomials, but I will keep it at a, at, at, at a high simple level. So what post-quantum crypto means is that I want to find alternatives for those public key algorithms that are not based on the two problems uh, that I use today or that the, the two mathemat mathematical problems that I use today that I refer to as integer factorization and uh, discrete log. So I want to find alternative mathematical problems that are higher in the complexity theory that a quantum computer is not expected to break, that one run efficiently on classical computers as well as quantum computers are hard to break by classical and quantum computers. And I will not claim here that they will not be able to be broken by quantum computers. And then, as I said, rely different on different mathematical problems than integer factorization or discrete logarithms. Today, the, the whole community of the whole cryptographic community is actually looking into finding those alternatives. 
that it has been a major effort by NIST in the US in order to do standardization or actually in order to find or to force the community to submit candidates and to standardize them. The, the, the competition is at round three. So in July 2020, they have announced seven finalists and eight alternates. And then hopefully by end of this year, the whole community is expecting to have those standards and, and also to probably what we are expecting is because they aren't like uh, the, the, also, we're expecting NIST to to um, to call for new candidates that will be submitted for digital signatures. Um, so the um, the alternative mathematical problems that we are looking at as as in the in the crypto community are based on lattices. They're based on codes, they're based on isogenies, they're based on symmetric alternatives, and this is what I call here the hash based um signatures and also they can be based on zero knowledge proofs today what we are looking at for alternative as i said it's mainly the asymmetric crypto that will be impacted or basically completely impacted so we are looking at alternatives for public key encryption um, this is what i refer to here as pke we are looking at alternative for key encapsulation mechanisms and this is the equivalent of the classical terms of key exchange and the hellman and then finally, we are looking at alternatives for signatures. So what, what we have developed today as in the, in the, in the uh, let's say in the uh, context of uh, uh, post-quantum crypto development and in the context of software development of libraries and hardware development of libraries, we have developed the first post-quantum crypto library in the uh, in the region, which we are, which actually allowing support to local companies that are interested in the transition from classical crypto systems to post quantum crypto systems. And this library is being developed in parallel with the NIST PQC standards or the sorry, the, the NIST PQC standardization effort. So we have taken the 15 remaining candidates, whether they are pure finalists or alternatives, we have implemented them, we have implemented our own algorithms, and we are also pushing for standardization to follow standardization of NIST and actually to have our own standardization efforts in the United Arab Emirates. Um, we are supporting most of the candidates, as I mentioned, we are developing a simple API and in this simple API, we want to offer compatibility with open source projects, so PQ, PQM4, which is also a lightweight version of post-quantum, OQS, and others. And we are pushing for the concept of agile design, or what, what we call um, in, in, in our research group as UFC, which is the, unif the, the uniform framework for, um, for cryptography. Um, the, the support is for multiple platforms. We are also supporting multiple instruction sets, and we are also performing instruction sets impl implementations. In terms of how does this, how does this post-quantum cryptography get integrated with products, we have already integrated all the output or the, basically the software developed library and the hardware developed library that is the result of this post quantum work that we are looking at we have in we have implemented it in chat application and secure communication application and vpn and vpn boxes and voice over ip protocols etc and obviously we are identifying the different challenges based on these implementation efforts that that we have and then we are also pushing for modularity and the crypto implementation for which we are setting a framework and also we are um, we are submitting this framework along with the um, NIST efforts so let me uh, let me actually move through this and then discuss the main risks and challenges that we are facing for uh, that we are facing in this implementations so one of the main challenges that we have is related to lack and and I will focus on this one in particular is lack of crypto agility so today in most of our systems that we have and by the way this is a concept that applies for any deployment of systems. So whether it, we're talking about cryptographic systems, whether we're talking about neural networks, whether we're talking about like any software uh, developed that needs to be integrated in the context of a larger system. 
So we have one of the main problems that we are facing when moving to an old algorithm to a new algorithm, or that we are facing from moving from classical to hybrid to post-quantum crypto, is what we call today the lack of cryptographic agility. So uh, today, most of the systems, they rely on what is known today. So AES, ChaCha, RSA, ECC, Diffie-Hellman, etc. But everything that has been implemented is implemented based on RFCs that kept on changing. So you have changes over changes, and then finally the implementation is not agile. So you don't have modularity in the way that those systems have been, um, have been developed and have been deployed. We are observing that most organizations today don't have the concept of an information governance framework. So if you go to any organization where, have, where they have to deploy cryptographic systems, um, ML systems, etc. They don't have a good understanding of what is being deployed and they don't have a good understanding in terms of what are the assets that I need to move or I need to upgrade from the classical to the post-quantum sense. And then finally, one of the main problems that we are facing in this move, move from the classical to post-quantum crypto is the lack of backward compatibility and interoperability requirements between classical systems between the systems that have to maintain a classical infrastructure for a while, especially on the critical infrastructure, and also the systems that we can move into uh, post-quantum uh, immediately. So what we, have, what we have developed basically is a unified cryptographic framework, a UCF. So in this unified cryptographic pro uh, in, in UCF or our unified cryptographic framework, we have basically identified the different components that typically go into a cryptographic library. And this concept actually can be generalized to any software to as a software framework beyond the cryptographic concept. So in any um, in, in, in basically whether we're talking about coding theory, whether we're talking about ML systems, whether we are talking about cryptographic systems, it's a software framework that can be adapted in order to introduce the concept of modularity and system integration, whether on the software or on the hardware side. So you see here that we have a public API. So this a public API is what we offer in terms of how does it integrate with our systems. And then we separate our cryptographic components into multiple and, and, and our cryptographic concepts, let's say, into multiple components. At the basic level, we have the primitives. So this is where we have our symmetric components, our asymmetric components, hash functions, random number generators, key derivation functions, etc. Then we go an upper level into the constructs, which basically combine all of the primitives together and then build on top of them. So here, for example, what you see here on the, on the right, so, um, for example, we have, uh, no, sorry, on, on the left here, so you see the standard con uh, constructs, which allow, which, which start to allow to build cryptographic protocols. So here we are talking about things like message authentication codes, key, key, um, key exchange or key encapsulation, true random number generators, key derivation functions, etc. Uh, we have one of contract constructs and this is where we start going into things like zero knowledge proofs into um, cryptography that that uses the concept that uses actually machine learning privacy preserving machine learning fully homomorphic encryption etc and then in addition to those constructs so you we can think about the primitives as the basic layer the const the constructs at the second layer and then on top of that we will have the layer which has to do with protocols and helpers. So this is a framework that we have developed that we have actually um, presented in parallel to the standardization efforts. And we are we are hoping that this that through this security abstraction layer and through this unified cryptographic framework to standardize also the process from moving uh, of, of moving from classical crypto to hybrid crypto to post quantum cryptographic uh, implementations. So uh, this is this is uh, this is the first uh, part of the talk. Uh, I kept it short because I think this is you know this. I just wanted to introduce the problem of post quantum uh, cryptography, 
And then what I will do now is that I will give a brief overview about each of the projects that um, I'm, I'm conducting. And actually, these are the topics that I also presented as part of the research that I can conduct uh, with, with the, some of the uh, university students at the intersection of machine learning, cryptography, and cybersecurity. Um, I have four topics to discuss. I will go into the details of uh, two of them, which are more on the um, on the applied side, both for um, crypt, uh, crypt analysis or the, the basically the, the, the science of studying crypto algorithms and also on the security of embedded systems. So uh, in general, the question that also I get asked when I say, okay, we are trying to model a cryptographic algorithms, uh, a cryptographic algorithm as a machine learning model. And the question I get asked is, Cryptography is all about math. It's all about, uh, it's basically about complexity theory. How can machine learning help? So what we are trying to do here is that we are not trying to replicate the output of a cryptographic um, algorithm, which in most cases for, for it to be secure, it, it, it is either BPP or NP from a complexity class. So what we are trying and, and Obviously, the implied operations and complexity classes are neither probabilistic, nor can we learn them approximately. So what we are trying to do today is that if I have a crypto algorithm that has a specific um, output, I want to find a machine learning that, that can output the same, let's say, the, that, that can give the same output of this crypto algorithm within a specific error that is accept acceptable that approximates the output of this crypto algorithm with the output of this machine learning. And, and what this means is that I can try to apply machine learning for studying specific cryptanalytic properties of uh, cryptanalytic properties of um, an algorithm. So the first area where we are trying to use machine learning for crypto or cryptanalysis is the use of machine learning for finding theoretical cryptanalytic properties of a specific uh, cipher. So cryptanalysis, before I get into the detail of this research, cryptanalysis can be seen as the analysis or as the science of studying security properties of a specific cipher, whether on the asymmetric or the symmetric part. For the symmetric part, there are multiple cryptanalysis techniques that we use both algebra, uh, basically they can be linear uh, to study the linear properties, to study the differential properties, um, to study some algebraic properties of a symmetric cipher. So cryptanalysis tries to break the crypto system or it tries to identify basically specific properties in the crypto systems, the, the crypto system that 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 break the, the, the security bounds. So the problem of using machine learning here comes to finding learning algorithm which space complexity grows only logarithmically and the size of the data sample needed. So some of the, for example, some of the areas that we are studying would be studying differential uh, distinguishers. So basically, if, um, if a machine learning is able, or a machine learning model or a neural network is able to identify relations between, a, between two plain texts that have a small differential, and then we can find this relation through the approximated neural network model, this automatically allows us to understand that there are differential distinguishers in the cipher, and it also allows us to understand the weight of this, um, of, of this differential distinguisher, which implies that we can understand the security bounds and then fix them in the design of a specific uh, symmetric cipher. So this is one of the areas that we are applying machine learning to the, to the, uh, to the problem of uh, to, studying, uh, to studying cryptographic systems. And in particular here, we're looking at uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric ciphers. The second area where we are applying machine learning to the field of cryptography is machine learning and side channel analysis. So side channel analysis basically has to do with the practical implementation of cryptographic systems. So we have software implementation at the same time. Also, we have hardware implementations that we do on FPGAs, on ASICs, on reconfigurable processors. 
Um, and for example, we also have those hardware implementations could be on a smart card, could be within the context of an RF system or other systems. And typically, if this implementation does not have the right countermeasures, does not have the right masking or thresholding, we say that this, this implementation is leaking. There are multiple, uh, multiple um, complexity of leakage. We have simple power leakage. Uh, basically, uh, this, is, this means that we have a very weak implementation. We have leakage that requires differential traces or basically a sort of a differential analysis to be conducted in order to understand or in order to recover keys. We have side channel analysis that can be conducted using profiling attacks, using template attacks, stochastic attacks, and, and, and others. So in, in, in such a setup, usually we have, as I mentioned, we have a crypto algorithm that is implemented and mainly in hardware, let's say it's a smart card uh, implementation. And what, what happens is that an attacker who is able to take um, signal profiles, whether he is taking a simple power trace or um, uh, or, a or, or multiple power traces or multiple power profile, by doing an analysis on these simple traces or on multiple traces and then studying the differential between them, that specific, specific attacker actually could be able to recover the key that is being used in um, the cryptographic implementation. And this is what I refer to here as the simple power analysis or SPA, differential power analysis or the DPA and other types of attacks. So how machine learning can help over here? So there are multiple ways that machine learning can be explored, but today the focus is how can I take those power profiles or the power traces from a specific cryptographic implementations Let's say here, I want to have a template attack using multiple power traces. How can I take the, the features that I can profile from those power traces? How can I basically train a neural network? And in most cases, we use CNNs in those cases. So you have the input layer, then you have the hidden layers, and then you have the output layers. The output layer basically will do a classification based on the type of attack. So for example, if I'm talking about hamming weight and an AES implementation of 256 bits, I will have nine classes here. And then basically the trained network will output which the, the trace correspond to which class. And by having, by having knowledge of this class, I can map the template of this AES uh, implementation, I can map it to the specific template and then through the knowledge of this um, class based on the Hamming weight, I can be able, I, I will be able to recover the key. And then basic, bas basically this, this is one of the types of attacks that we, or, or basically this is one of the ways machine learning can help us with classifying a trace, mapping a template uh, to, uh, to, to its mapping the class to a template and recovering the secret keys that are being used for the specific crypto um, implementation. So we, we're still at early stages of uh, using uh, neural networks for modeling side channel analysis. Um, uh, but, but this is one of the main uh, areas of research that hardware uh, cryptographers and then cryptographers that are mainly focused on, um, on hardware accelerators along multiple areas are using in order to benefit from machine learning in the, in, in the area of hardware cryptanalysis and then also securing hardware implementations and hardware accelerations. Um, the, the third area which we're conducting, and this is, uh, this is uh, an area of research with, which I'm collaborating with uh, Princeton University on, it has to do with security on energy constraint uh, devices. And what, what, uh, what the concept of what we are trying to do here is that can I have local intelligence on embedded systems by deploying pruned and quantized neural networks on those devices in order to be able to run cryptographic implementations, lightweight cryptographic libraries, and also 
um, and also basically intrusion uh, detection system. So the research is split in two parts. The first part has been already conducted by a team there and the, the paper that it refers to is called SCAN. And the idea here is that we, we, de we develop neural network models then the initial derived architecture, which is heavy to be run on embedded systems, will be pruned by having, by basically first growing the number of neurons in the network, growing the number of the connections in the network, and then doing connection pruning in order to be able to, uh, to obtain a final architecture that is as accurate as possible from the initial derived architecture. And in our experimental data, we had almost 95 to 96% accuracy. And then ha taking this final pruned uh, neural network model, implementing it, um, implementing it on the edge device, and then basically derive, and then um, and then have this derived model implemented using a software hardware architecture. So we are at the point where we have derived those pruned neural network to be running on the edge devices. And then the second step of what we are trying to do today, and this is a continuation of the work, is that by having those neural network on edge devices, we can collect information about various vulnerabilities or about various vulnerability exploits on uh, edge devices, uh, model the vulnerability, basically model the execution on this edge device as an acyclic graph. And then based on this acyclic graph, the execution will be captured as a regular expression and as a sequence of blocks. And then we run as when then we run SVMs in order to find new connections in the in the graph and then to find new zero days and then new possible exploits of vulnerabilities on the system. This is another work that has been published. It's called Sharks. And this is one of the topics that I'm also suggesting to conduct further research. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, once you have those um, neural networks on the edge devices that can run on the edge devices, there will be lots of saved energy from from constant let's say from this from this communication that is no longer needed between the edge device the mobile and the cloud so once the all uh, some of the intelligence or most of the intelligence is offset on the edge device the energy saved from the need of this communication can be used locally in order to um, implement machine learning powered uh, intrusion detection systems, vulnerability management systems, cyber reasoning, and also in order to be able to do some sort of automated incident response on, uh, on the device um, itself. Um, finally, the other area where, um, where, where, where we're using today uh, machine learning for cryptography and also for, um, for, for cryptography and also for, um, for cybersecurity is the whole area of fully homomorphic encryption, which today is used for privacy preserving on the cloud. So today, um, Today, if you look, if you look on how um, conventional encryption happens on the cloud and also with the uh, cloud service providers, um, if I have my data and I want to store it in the uh, in uh, with a cloud service providers, usually either the cloud service provider owns the the key management system. So basically, he will assign either a public private key pair for me or he will give me a secret key, which I will use in order to be able to decrypt the data, whether I encrypt it for transmission or I encrypt it for uh, storage. And then that same data that I stored in encrypted form on the site, I will have to decrypt it in order to be able to perform operations or any sort of data processing on the cloud. So what this means is that even though as a user, I have the reassurance that my data is encrypted and protected in the cloud, this means two things. One is that the cloud service provider still owns the keys. So the cloud service provider practically, whether, you know, in most cases we assume an honest or a semi-honest cloud service provider, but practically they can still access my data. And also this means that, um, 
let's say a, a nefarious actor on the cloud that is on another vm what he can do is that somehow if the, the kms implementation of the cloud service provider is vulnerable he would be able to somehow attack the the, the implementation of this kms and then basically uh, retrieve the keys and attack my data so uh, the disadvantage of this, as I was saying, and this is what I have here, is that the data must be decrypted for manipulation and re-encrypted for storage. And then the cloud service has access to the private data, leaving data vulnerable to abuse and the key a target to cyber attacks. So neither do I have the assurance from the CSP, nor do I have the assurance from potentially malicious players that are on the same systems and then can access this, um, this system. So how how can how can machine learning help here so here i we get into the whole concept of privacy preserving machine learning privacy preserving machine learning using fully homomorphic encryption and multi party computation um it's a it's a topic that is um fairly new actually some people call it the whole grail of cryptography or the whole grail of cryptography using uh, machine learning and at a high level what we are doing here is that we are trying to use machine learning for a computing service while retaining the confidentiality of the training and testing the data using homomorphic encryption uh, schemes so in 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 a simpler way or to say it in a simpler way is that i encrypt the data at the source like as a user who has the key or that i encrypt um, the data as, at, at the source using a homomorphic uh, function and then I store this homomorphically encrypted data on the cloud and then later on when I want to do any processing of my information on the cloud I keep it encrypted and then through machine learning uh, models I would be able to actually perform operations on uh, on 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 this uh, on on this data so by operations today uh, what it could mean that let's say for example i'm dealing with encrypted numbers i can do additions i can do negations i can do multiplications and all of this is actually being done on the cipher text in order to compute any function of arbitrary complexity so the advantage of this approach is data is manipulated without um, decryption um, uh, I don't need, uh, I don't need, if I need to access a specific cloud service, I don't need to expose my plain text, I don't need to decrypt it, I only leverage public material and the cipher text. However, the disadvantage, and this is why, as I mentioned today, they call it the holy grail of encryption, is that most operations, here I put some, but most operations on encrypted data can be um, very slow. So this means that if I have a time critical operation that I need to, to do, um, basically um, this is not a practical solution, at least not, not as of yet. A lot of groups, a lot of research groups are trying to um are trying to basically do hardware acceleration so whether they are doing hardware accelerations for the matrix triple and the processing step whether they are doing hardware accelerations later on in the operations of the relus and activation functions etc but we're not yet there so we still have a lot of optimization work that has to be done both on the pre-processing on the machine learning part and also on the uh, functions that are used or the homomorphic encryption uh, functions um the as as you if, if you're familiar with the concept of federated learning you can imagine that privacy preserving schemes using fully homomorphic encryption can be very beneficial for federated learning however in this context the 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 concept is is inverted somehow so in this context what uh, we're and this is an implementation that we are working on today um, the machine learning model that is uh, so basically in, in the case of federated learning, we need multiple players to be able to provide the information that they have to a centralized server or to a centralized identity. Um, today, we have lots of data silos. So if we talk about the concept of medical studies or medical data uh, sharing, because of privacy concerns from the different uh, hospitals, we have lots of silos in the data and processing the data and also studying the data. So if we have a specific 
medical study that needs to happen that needs like basically let's say that you need um to train a deep neural network, there is not enough data that is being contributed from the various players, and this is mainly because of um, privacy techniques. So how fully homomorphic encryption uh, can, can help here is that the multiple entities or the multiple hospitals that we have, what they can do is that they can do their local learning, so they can take their data and then they can derive the uh, machine learning model, their neural network, and then they can encrypt it. And then each of the hospitals can uh, contribute this encrypted uh, machine learning model for the central server. And this server, because of the homomorphic encryption that happened over these models, it doesn't need to redo the decryption of the models. You can just do an aggregated model while keeping the, the confidentiality of those models intact. And by having this aggregated model, basically we would have access the multiple um, multiple sources of data, and we would have a better, um, a, a better final machine learning model in order to be applied to the uh, use case in, in mind. So this emerging technique is called federated learning. Uh, it eliminates privacy concerns. Um, the training of the training of the model, as I said, will happen locally in the data silo location, and the aggregator combines learning into a global model, which is shared to data owners. So it is sent back to the data owners in order for them to be able to use it for a specific um, use case. Based on, uh, based on preliminary research uh, results that we had is that using this model, we can have almost 99% matching accuracy with the local learning based on this um, on this aggregated model. So, um, in 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 uh, in in summary, this fully homomorphic encryption can be used for a, a protected case and to augment the security of federated learning. Um, it 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 uh, it addresses some of the security and privacy threats. Uh, that we have today, for example, against model extraction, model poisoning, model inversions, but at the same time, we still need algorithm defenses and confidentiality and integrity measures. Which brings me to the to the to the last part of this talk, um, which actually has to do. I spoke so far about what, how could machine learning be used for cybersecurity and cryptography, and then the last part, actually, and I will go through it very fast, is that how can crypto and cybersecurity actually benefit machine learning um so today um uh, today we we uh, i mean at least like in the in the various work that we do is that we we derive machine learning models we we place them for in in uh, autonomous systems we place them for like for example you have neural networks that are doing feature detection or feature matching or object recognition on big drones that in most cases are subject to adversarial attacks and in most cases we don't have any sort of obfuscation or any type of encryption of these machine learning models so we have seen at least in the in the in the center today we have seen multiple cases or we have demonstrated multiple cases of how a machine learning model both the confidentiality and the integrity of a machine learning model can be attacked while it is being used real time in um in in, in various systems so cryptography can be used uh, for protecting machine learning models so one uh, through encrypting a specific model we can ensure the confidentiality of this model and the data both during the training and also while the machine learning model is being used real time for classification so whether we're talking about local learning distributed learning or an aggregated federated learning uh, model um, i have presented uh, before a multi-party computation and fully homomorphic encryption this can enhance confidentiality and the privacy of uh, machine learning models um, cryptography can pre prevent models from not being tampered with and this has to do with having golden images and also hashing uh, the models nor introducing bias for profit or control um this one other work that we're working on today is that actually it's two things one is studying adversarial properties of specific ml model and then seeing how cryptography can prevent um 
you know, if we have, I don't know, an, any adversarial attacks or SNA or gradient attacks, etc., we're also trying to understand how cryptography can help prevent adversarial machine learning from ma manipulating data. And this study has to do with uh, studying the adversarial properties of a model and at the same time looking into how cryptography can help uh, prevent those adversarial um, attacks from manipulating data in addition to the robustness of a specific model to adversarial attacks. And then the last the last problem that um, we are trying to, to study is that how can I introduce cryptographic randomness and training uh, deep neural network models um, in order to be able to increase their adversarial rob their robustness or their adversarial um, robustness properties. So um, so if if I am to to um, uh, to to club them, so multi-party computation and fully homomorphic um, encryption enable to enhance confidentiality and uh, privacy, and it enables basically processing of data while it remains encrypted at all times. Uh, cryptography can also help with obfuscation to prevent models inversion. And then finally, and this is something that I didn't mention earlier, is that along with um, the, the, the along with cryptography being applied to the models themselves, we can link. Uh, the implementation of those machine learning models within a trusted execution environment or actually within a root of trust. And then we can um, basically this, this neural network model will be signed and linked and, and, um, and what we call in the cryptographic terms binded to a specific root, a root of trust and TE in, in the system where this machine learning model is uh, being implemented. So uh, again, this is another area of research that uh, we're just starting. And this is one, it's, it's actually very interesting, especially as we're starting to deploy um, uh, neural network models in, uh, in real time operations. And, uh, uh, and this is something that we will be continuing and focusing uh, a lot on. And with this, I think my I will end the, the, the talk here. And if there are any questions, uh, as I said, please put them in the Q&A box and I will be happy to answer them. Okay, I have uh, I have a question in reference to the side channel uh, side channel challenge. Can the power leakage attack be secured against using noise added to the power signal to fool the attacker? Curious to know, as there are many adversarial defenses, what you mentioned towards the end against that type of attack. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Fahri, for this. In fact, yes, and this is what I meant before about. Uh, what, what I mentioned before about, uh, you know, adding countermeasures uh, in order to secure a specific cryptographic implementation against those side channel attacks. So uh, noise, uh, noise is one thing to be added. The other um, technique that we use today in order to, um, uh, other techniques that we use as countermeasures would be uh, having thresholded implementation to add masking, um, uh, to add masking both from a software and a hardware perspective. And basically, what you can also do, especially when it comes to um, looking at timing profile, we usually have. Uh, what we call constant time implementations and thresholded constant time implementations so that you know the the, the bits in the keys uh, do not allow the, the 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 attacker to gain information about the timing of the operation whether you're having like for example you're multiplying by zero or by one typically you have different timing profiles so we add this noise we add these countermeasures that are done by masking and thresholding in order to prevent against that however having said that today lots of implementations remain um, remain vulnerable for two reasons one is because you 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 may not know um, it's very hard to have a constant time implementation or it's very hard to, to threshold all your implementation and to mask it. And the second point which you face, we, we face a lot in real time implementation and, and actually in, in real systems integration is that 
usually you are limited to the number of um, of uh, hardware resources that you can use so let's say i want to implement my algorithm on a zinc fpga in most cases they will tell you you have x percent of the hardware resources or of the registers or the flip-flops that you can use for crypto you have uh, you have y percent that you can use for error correction and the rest should remain empty in order to add noise or to, in order to um to implement the threshold that implementation usually you have to um, add quite a bit over the hardware resources that you need over the vanilla implementation and this is why you end up in in um, in, in, in vulnerable implementations in general um i i, I hope this uh, answered your question Okay, um, so I believe uh, the second uh, the second question. Sure, great, thank you. Uh, so the second question is um, concerning the uh, energy consumption machine learning challenge. So let let me let me try to explain in, in better terms what what I meant through this research. So the 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 output of the ML does not affect the cryptography algorithm directly, and I do believe you're referring to um, to this one. One second. Um, I, I, do, I do believe you're referring to this research. So here, the, the idea is that by having these prune networks and by being able to implement those prune networks on energy constrained devices and have a high accuracy level, what you would be able to do is to, uh, to, to save lots of energy that otherwise you would have spent on the communication between the M device, the edge device and the cloud. So. Uh, our experiment showed that you can save almost 30% of the whole energy profile on the embedded system. And this whole 30%, you can use it in order to be able to run cryptographic algorithms, lightweight cryptographic algorithms, or, um, or, other, um, or other like security functions like intrusion detection, automated IR, et cetera. So this is more of an enablement. So basically here, what the research does is that through inference that is enabled by pruned uh, NNs, you enable further cryptographic implementations on those edge devices or further cyber implementation, cyber systems or cyber solution implementations on those uh, edge devices or embedded systems. So I, I hope this is what what you wanted to to ask. Otherwise, I mean, I can I can uh, get deeper into the 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 answer. Great. I guess we still have a few minutes. If there are any other questions that uh, anyone has. I think that's uh, all, Dr. Najwa. Thank you so much for the talk. I think there's no more questions. Okay, great. So I hope it was uh, it was helpful to highlight all the areas that we're working at the intersection of machine learning and crypto. And uh, if there are any other questions that uh, that that come to mind for later, I can take them over over email. All right. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much.